welcome to The Horror Hangout, a podcast where film fans watch the best and worst horror movies of all time and have a lovely talk about them. Today's episode, I have a very special bonus episode for you, chatting all about a film that premiered at Fright Fest Glasgow earlier this month in the UK. Uh, my name is Andy Conduit Turner, and today I am joined by two very special guests, Alex Austin and Keir Sewart, directors of the toxic relationship breakup buddy horror, Kill Your Lover. How are you both? Thanks for joining me. Good, yeah, yeah, thanks thank for you. having us. Amazing. And I mean, well, before we get into it, let me give anyone who hasn't got the uh, got the background here a little bit about the film. Um, so Dakota has had enough of her toxic relationship with Axel, but the feeling isn't mutual. As she tries to end things, Axel becomes something different, something monstrous. Gradually succumbing to the poison of the decaying relationship becomes a creature increasingly aggressive, a touch that melts skin, and worse of all, he's contagious. So thank you, Ben, very much for the synopsis and get everything together. We were there. We got to see it live. Um, congratulations on the on the movie as well, both, by the way. I enjoyed it very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. no, it was um, really great to see it with an audience and get such a great, like, vocal response to, like, all the moments that we could have hoped for. So, yeah, it was just great seeing it with, you know, the whole sold out 300 people. It was just a fantastic yeah. experience. It's a nice yeah, venue as well, isn't it? Because, you know, I'm uh, I'm half Scottish. You know, I grew up partially in Scotland, even though I don't sound it. Uh, so kind of like it felt like being able to have its UK premiere in Scotland was felt especially special. Yeah, it was really special. Wonderful. So, I mean, before we get onto the film uh, itself and where we got there, let's go back a little bit, shall we? Tell me a little bit about your horror history as fans as filmmakers of all the genres you could have found yourself in how did you end up here well our, our funny sort of path into things is that when we first started making films together we were actually making a lot more comedies um and it was sort of like more sketch stuff 48 hour film projects like that was basically my film school whereas Kira actually went to uh, film school um and yeah, but I think that really helped us like with timing. Um, and then it was only actually more like, well, 2018, so six years ago now that we did our first actual proper horror. Well, I think I'm I'm like very old school in the sense that like, you know, I grew up watching like a lot of like B movies, you know, with my dad. So, you know, especially like watching like old like uh William Castle movies you know things like you know House on Haunted Hill and then also you know I was really into like Robert Wise's The Haunting and you know like I, I liked I watched like a lot of old like black and white movies a lot of like black and white sci-fi and horror and then kind of like as I got into my but I got I got very scared easily so it was like those black and white movies were kind of the things that I was able to watch and then uh, I remember around my teens was when I finally, you know, sort of managed to like sit through like actual like horror movies. And the ones that really like got me was, you know, I was obsessed with the VHS cover for um, John Carpenter's The Thing, mm -hmm. which I have like tattooed on my arm. Um, and You're on camera, show them. And but, uh, <laughs> so, right there. Um, yeah, you see, these are the benefits if you join uh, us on the video feed of this as well. Yeah. Huh? <laughs> Bon bonus if you're watching the video. Uh, but yeah, and then just like, I just really gravitated towards like body horror, like, you know, uh, the fly, you know, just like everything, anything like gooey and fucked up and, you know, sort of like, you know, but I, I think I always- You have a weird obsession with black goo in particular. Yeah. Like One, it's think... very strange. I'm not quite sure what that means. I'm figuring it, I'm, I'm working it out. But... One day I'll know the answer. Well, and I think that's why too, we kind of ended up really gravitating towards, you know, like body horror and so like we made a short film called wretch which was kind of like which did like the rounds and like went to a lot of horror festivals and ended up getting um going up on altar and then that kind of was like the thing that kicked everything into gear for us because mm -hmm. that's how we ended up as part of an anthology feature you know Old isolation which came out uh it was at fright fest 2021 actually um, and then, yeah, basically we just haven't looked back since then. We're just committed yeah. to horror. I think, I think that was the thing is I think we had such a healthy respect for horror that I feel like it took us a while to feel confident enough to actually try and make horror films because it's so, I think, I think there's, there's, 
people always talk about how it's like it's a very forgiving genre in a lot of ways people are like far more willing to be like forgiving in terms of uh production limitations and money but i still think like you have to take seriously like the craft of horror yeah in a lot of ways. i think in that sense you were in awe of horror yeah like you wanted to be respectful of it I guess, yeah right? so comedy easy this is horror <laughs> that was the thing we, we really had to build up to yeah you say that though in the comedy and i think you can hearing you both describe that now you can kind of see where your comedic backgrounds come in as well because i mean this is a horror film there are there are elements of body horror to it but you hit some very nice sort of comedic beats dialogue wise in terms of just some of the looks and exchanges that we get in there as well i think you already nailed it when you were discussing there the timing that is so important in a successful piece of comedy while the rhythms might be slightly different in a horror film it's still so, so important to hit those beats at exactly the right time to have your audience on the on the ride with you and have them work out the things at the time you want them to work them out and anticipate and then react at the right times as well. So it must be incredibly important. Did, did you find that helped you when you were making the film, that background? Thank you. Yeah, all of the, I will stress that all the comedies we made were extremely dark in nature. Yeah. <laughs> so um, the, the shadows have always been there. The inner yeah. demons were just waiting to come out, I guess. Um, but yeah, no, I definitely think that that helped. And I think with um, Kill Your Lover in particular, like, you know, it's not it's not like what I call funny haha. It's not like point and laugh. It's more life is absurd. Love is absurd some of the stuff we do is very strange and sort of like, I think we got very specific with things on purpose because we thought that would resonate with people more rather than, I don't know, having generic general characters. Um, but like, as far as the comedy was concerned, I think, you know, we we do love a, a setup punchline and also lots of visual comedy, actually. The lamp, um, the recurring yep. lamp story, um, I think just, uh, really entertained people a lot I think. Well, well, I think we were very like inspired by South Korean cinema and South mm. Korean cinema has these really kind of like intense like tonal shifts so you're watching like something like old boy and you're going from really like intense like you know scenes of like you know a a guy getting his like teeth like pulled out by a hammer but then you'll have these kind of almost incredibly broad like slapstick moments that'll like come is as part of that and I always just found um Park Chan-wook's kind of like thing about it. He's like, you know, sometimes the things you're doing are so absurd, you you have to kind of like acknowledge that in some kind of a way. And I think, especially with this project, I think part of it was to say, you know, we're, we're telling an absurd story here. So at a certain point, people are going to realize the, the internal logic of the characters, everything is that they're going to acknowledge how absurd what's going on is. And you can't, you 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 kind of have to steer into that sometimes you know yeah. and i think that was kind of like it's the comedy more comes from the commitment to the moment and mm. the commitment to the bit rather than just simply undermining or kind of like making fun of what you're doing yeah i think that line is is very tricky but it's something that you know we've got quite used to and i think mm. it's something that interests us and i think we'll continue to sort of uh excavate as we go yeah. as we make the movies and I feel like when you navigate this, that balance very well, that slight break in the tension, you know, like a moment of levity or a moment that you can just, as you say, laugh at the absurdity of the situation and just that it's a nice break that actually endears you more to the characters, makes you care more about what's happening to them. So yeah, really well, um, really well put together from, from that sense of me. But as you, you know, when you started making this film, how did you begin talking about it where was the where, what was the seed that the idea germinated from yeah so zombie yeah so like the the original the original idea literally came from the fact that we were like we really we ostensibly we just wanted to make a feature you know and we were trying to figure out how can we make a feature for very little money and very little resources and so the idea initially came from the this whole idea of we, we talked about how difficult it would be to actually kill one zombie if you got trapped in your flat with a zombie especially and, if it was me versus you and yeah. you handed to a zombie like but, he is six foot two and i'm like five eight so it's like you know how difficult would that well, actually be because it's always when shown I, as quite 
you know, in some movies, it's like, okay, well, I just whacked him over the head with a, a spade and yeah. now he's dead, you know. Well, I think it's like, it's like, even if you think about like, because I've had this where there's been like a spider in the bath and you try and kill it and it just won't die and you can't <laughs> yeah. like, but, you know, think about like that if like you had a human, like a human being that's turned into a zombie that wants to eat you and how difficult that would be. And we were kind of like, okay, we could make a movie that's just about somebody trying to kill one zombie. And then you start to start going through the logic of it where you go like, well, it, it's more interesting if there's some kind of emotional connection to this zombie. So maybe there can be a transfer, uh, some sort of transfer or some kind of point where the person's turning into a zombie. So you get more dramatic potential out of it. And then the problem was once the character becomes a zombie, then you're kind of like, well, you, you feel like you're losing a lot of dramatic potential because then the person's just a, a monster. And they can't talk. Yeah. And I think, you know, we're very drawn to say like, because like most of what we've made is essentially monster movies of some sort of form. Mm -hmm. But I think you know, what's really engaging to us is say like the universal monsters where like they're, they're characters that have some kind of internal, uh, you know, sort of uh, the feelings and, uh, you know, there, there's, there's a kind of more interesting, like rich sort of like mm. character stuff to go with it. Yeah. So kind of like, so that kind of how we then found the zombie element was kind of limiting. And then we kind of were like, well, we can just kind of make up our own rules. Like, why do we need to make it a zombie? Well, and coming into the universal monster side of things like we were re-watching a lot of them earlier uh in the year i think two years ago and frankenstein in particular is like a big one for us and i think one of the things that started developing is i think because of where the idea originally came from we were like well obviously we're on you know the lead female side and then as we started developing the film as well we were like i think it's a lot more interesting and I, me in particular yeah. i remember pushing for i think it's much more interesting if Axel also has his points mm -hmm. not to say that either of them is particularly right or particularly wrong but there's a lot more nuance to be had from that and like I think we very much started leaning into the idea that you know even though they become monstrous like neither one of the characters is the monster for us it was the relationship that had become the monster basically yeah that was a big takeaway from me sitting in that audience there I think you obviously put a lot of care into the dialogue and the relationship for that exact reason you described while there is i think primarily as the film goes you begin you have an antagonist and you have your your lead character that you know is in opposition to them but what i really took away from it was that not everyone is entirely bad not everyone is entirely good they there are faults in there and there are things that you can think about from those people and i think you really drew it out with the dialogue particularly around the the state of their relationship and how they were unpicking those ones. Um, where did you draw that inspiration from? How did you go about developing those kind of discussions? A lot of uh, a lot of daytime talk shows and watching people people's <laughs> relationship cook fall apart. Oh, probably far more personal than people would like to know, or maybe like more like in the to... sense that like we pulled from our own relationship, of course, as well. But we also drew from friends' relationships, and so I wouldn't want to like necessarily go into we we like to joke that i'm i'm more like dakota you're more like axel and then in the broad strokes in the broadest strokes yeah. of it but i like... mean i think it's like that that the the main course like i think it's kind of dakota's so innately creative whereas axel is more steadfast and a little bit more responsible in many ways. There's just more going for. There's just more going for. I'm a fucking mess, and you're the. Uh, oh, you're I see. <laughs> well, I'll take it then. Um, but uh, there's sort of this clash of, um, two people who could potentially be together, but it's more they are looking at the other person and seeing the sort of romanticized idea of their life and how they could maybe become more like that person. So Axel wants to be more in Dakota's world and Dakota's like, oh, well, maybe if I'm with him, then my life will come together a little bit more. Well, I think we were very inspired by this like, notion of of a couple that we knew where um, the person, the the female was more of an artist and she had been through, had led a fairly wild 20s. And she was suddenly at this point where she's like, I need to find a stable person. And she ended up being with this person who was the very opposite you know he was a very like stable sort of guy 
but he was cool like oh this person's an artist i really inspire i'm really aspire to be more of an artist and you kind we kind of always felt like they the two of them were kind of in love with the concept of each other mm. rather than the person it's what the person represented more than the person was themselves and so that was always our starting point with axel and dakota with this idea that they're in love with the concept of what the other person is and what the other person could represent to them more than they're in love with the actual personality and you know person that they're with yeah and like actually trying to grow together instead of trying to like like force this other idea yeah. out of it like they just don't listen to each other enough i think and then it's like dialing that up to 11 but when it comes to like the dialogue itself like that was very much drawn from very like specific moments that we'd come across or people have told us about um some of it's us um but some of the cute moments are us as well so it's like you know one of the things i will admit to um and people who have seen the movie will understand which moment this is but there's the bit where um Dakota says she needs to go to work and then she's sort of last minute slaps Axel on the bum before running away and he can't cut, quite catch her and it's like a playful moment and he's like why are you always slapping my ass and then she says because it's so fucking cute and that's directly drawn from our relationship <laughs> because I'm definitely guilty of doing that you no. don't hate it <laughs> you have to be ready to chase quicker um, yeah I know I mean Get speaking back, like Speaking of the film and in real life as well, another bonus for those of you on video, I can see one of your pieces of set, a piece of the lighting behind um, behind you right now as well. I now need to ask, was that part of your home decor originally or is that a bit of set dressing that you decided, I've got a place for this. This Is this your lamp, Alex? Is this your, your <laughs> beloved lamp? No, this is, uh, this is very much a, mm, yes, we'll have that after the shoot, I think. Yeah. Um, so definitely nab to that. It's actually kind of like, it's really good for watching movies because you basically black everything out and then you put that on and you have like this kind of like slight pink sort of like light, which kind of creates like a really sort of good sort of like glow for the TV screen, but doesn't put you in total darkness. So it's like, yeah, it's, it's our, it's our kind of movie watching light. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, to be honest as well for our podcast, it's good horror hangout theme lighting as well. I might have to see if we've got Patreon money for this kind of setup for <laughs> For a studio at some point um, yeah just go led not neon and save yourself some money <laughs> <laughs> there we go um so i mean we've talked about the development of the the film itself and the story it would be remiss of me not to talk about some of the body horror and the gore and of course kia the black goo um yeah. how did you go about making that i know for a for an independent film budget's always a concern but you know no spoilers here as well I think there were some lovely body horror and lovely gory moments that would have not been out of place at the end of a round of Mortal Kombat for some of them as well. Um, <laughs> that is, yeah. I was about to mention that because that's not the first time we've heard that. Well, I, um, think, I think it's, it's uh, so first off, you know, definitely want to credit. Uh, so Rebecca Wheeler, who did uh, the makeup, she had worked on another short film that we made called Do Not Resuscitate where Alex actually plays the monster in that. Mm. And it's actually kind of almost like a dry run because it's about two paramedics who show up at uh, a call to find a dead body. And it turns out the dead body is not as dead as it initially seems. So, um, and it also has black goo in it. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, but yeah, so kind of like we had a really good working relationship on that. Um, and so we kind of got in touch with her very early on yeah. and we kind of had Especially all because of the black veins like the black veins were the main thing that we wanted yeah. to really get in and um for, for the sfx nerds out there um she rebecca ended up making her own sort of bondo um basically to to allow for the budget to work as well rather than you know getting it shipped in so she 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 worked really hard on that and um i think the effects uh, end result were, was really great i mean she ended up winning um best effects at brooklyn horror film festival actually so very proud moment it was definitely it was, it was a stressful process too because it was like at least a couple of hours in the chair for like shane and so we also like pretty much before each day we had to know kind of like how much of him was in shot what what needed to be done where yeah. so it's like certain days like it was only his front that would be covered but then like there were days where we had to get two actors made up and we needed about she, so rebecca then had like two assistants also working on it for like for like three hours to try and get it all together so it was yeah. it was a big 
stressful process to say the least. Um, but kind of like, yeah, I mean, I think that that's one of those things where you just, you kind of, you really want to show up and make sure that you've actually like stick the landing on all of these things. And then not only that, but black veins, but also like there's several don't, kills. Don't, don't, don't spoil it. I'm not spoiling okay. anything. Just, just check. <laughs> yeah, but, it's like, but it's like, um, but there's like, you know, several kills in the film that are very elaborate and, so we had to storyboard those very carefully and kind of like really so kind of like we knew what was on show at any given point and like what we were bringing towards because like one of the worst things that you can see and you learn a lot when you watch like effects movies is where people don't shoot the effects properly because really you need to like really sell things through the angles yeah. in the best possible way. I would way. say, you know, getting good, good balance of like not over lighting as well, which can be really like difficult because sometimes you're like oh i spent so much money on this thing now i want to like show it off but then it doesn't work it's um, the atmosphere but... right i guess if it's yeah, overlit it's also yeah because you can end up showing the the fringes of things too much otherwise but i think this is where like doing the short films that we did both wretch and um my uh the short film that we did sucker which was also at fright fest which is about a giant leech creature um which I have in my cupboard, <laughs> which terrifies all of our guests. Um, we really love practical effects as well. So I think what was really helpful from those shorts was almost having like a dry run to see how much we really needed to show and how much we could do with sound as well, um, because sound is huge for us. And I think a lot of the time effects can actually be more effective if you show a little bit less and do a little bit more with sound. So I think Sucker in particular was like a really good one in terms of getting the balance right and figuring out, you know, how we wanted to apply that to the feature. So that's how we saved some money as well. Yeah. In the long and run. it's good to have that light touch as well sometimes, isn't it? Because as you say, especially you can sometimes expose your limitations by going too far and showing too much. And for my money, certainly no spoilers for anyone, but I think there are some really effective body horror and gore scenes in there um so i mean let's talk about the reactions i've given you mine but um what's the feedback been from audiences so far it's been interesting because we certainly each festival brings its own kind of like different um different vibe mm. to it as well so it's like brooklyn like Brooklyn really, really like honed in on the the comedy. So it was it was it was the opening night film uh, at its world premiere, which was Brooklyn Horror, and just like everybody was like really like laughing. It was like very like it was a very big experience. Um, and then it was really funny because we went to we did a, a private industry screening in L.A. and you could have heard a pin drop through the entire thing because we were kind of going like because there'd been a review afterwards that was like. Uh, Kill your lover, your new favorite black comedy, and we were like, "Oh, I guess I guess we're a black we comedy." Did. We didn't realize yeah. it, uh, but then like we went to this industry screening, nobody laughed, and then we were like talking to people afterward. They were like, "Oh my god, it was so funny," and I was like, well, "We didn't laugh at all," and they we're like, "Oh yeah, well, I, I just didn't know if I was supposed to." Um, and then so yeah, and then we we've so it's been. But I think it was like that they felt like the intensity. I think yeah. more from that perspective, and the sound was particularly awesome in in that sort of smaller industry yeah, yeah. screening space as well. So everyone was getting really swept up in the music. I think as well that was a big feedback point from Brooklyn as well as people were like, "When can I buy the album?" And the the answer is soon. <laughs> well, I think, and I think so. Obviously, Fright Fest. It was a really. It was a it was a really interesting one because we didn't really get a chance to talk to people much afterwards because it was such a late night screen. Everyone kind of mm -hmm. like left um, and uh, kind of like uh, we, I had, didn't, we didn't get the Q and A off. We didn't get the Q and A afterwards, so we didn't kind of like uh, quite get like the same ability to sort of like quite see like the same like reactions and stuff like that that we have at other festivals. Um, but certainly it really felt like people laughed at the points they were supposed to. I heard at least one person make an audible noise during a, one of the kills. So that was good. Uh, the guy in front of me walked out after 15 minutes. I don't know if he was sleepy or just uh, it was too much for him. But um, <laughs> but uh, no, I mean, I think uh, I think, you know, we were we've been really pleased with how like audiences have reacted to it. I mean, one one thing that I'm, I'm definitely very grateful for is I, I heard from someone who's attended Fright Fest before is that the 11 p.m can be like, you know, later later on in the day and then some pass holders don't come, but we still had a full full house. So yeah. clearly, clearly people were into it. So happy about that. 
Yeah, I think it was well attended. Um, like you say, a shame that you were, I mean, for everyone else listening, context-wise, Kill Your Lover was the last film of the first full day, so the Friday night, right? So, yeah, yeah sadly, because people have homes to go to and there are, you know, yeah. more, <laughs> cinema staff particularly have homes to go to, oh, yeah. um, we weren't able to stay for a Q&A afterwards, which was uh, a shame, So I think it would have been nice for you to hear a little bit more from the audiences, but heard positive I've heard positive things um, as well and I guess as well the other thing when you look at an agenda like this is where else you've sat in the running order like what's come before and after you I know from the second day so you were you were free of this one but um the second day of the event myself there were a couple of fairly heavy going you know really serious and there's an absolutely a place for those they're really powerful movies but I think some levity after those can really so you also might see where you sit in the running order of things as well not just the time of day but what's come before and how people are how people are, are holding up mentally by that time as well and for me obviously we'd had some other lighter films during the day as well but after a start of that first day that had been really heavy in some psychological dramas a lot of foreign language films you know shame on me if i could speak french i wouldn't need to read the subtitles it was nice to finish <laughs> that first day looking at some uh, a couple of films back to back that were that had a bit of levity to them definitely still brought the horror elements as well so for me this was a really really great midnight movie to finish off the the first day it was a lot of fun and like i think it's fair to say that we tend to bring a shot of adrenaline I mean, into into any program so i'm glad that that seems to still be the case think... for our feature because this is our debut feature so you know um carrying on that trend from our, our short films is that's great that's I great mean, feedback i mean i think ultimately too i mean i think the thing that you know you, you do want is you you kind of want your film to make some kind of impression so it's like you know just being a sort of like generic middle of the road film you don't kind of like you you, you kind of don't want it to be boring like you know if you're gonna like you're gonna make a debut feature you want to you kind of almost want to attract people who like really get it they really vibe with it or you know you probably want at least a few people to hate it as well you know just get like you know it, it gets it gets some kind of reaction we're, we're always gonna go bigger and bolder i yeah. think rather than the reverse so yeah you're absolutely right it's really preferable to draw an opinion positive or negative they're talking about these things and from my perspective positive i won't ask you to throw other films under the buzz and take about you know talk about things that you don't like but for me some of the biggest challenges of things being released mainstream outside genre events when i look at some of the things that are being that are getting cinema releases from bigger studios now that's my exact problem that i feel people take less risks they want a safe option and to the point um, critique on a film we did recently recently on the main feed was that almost the beats feel algorithmically generated and, they've, and the creative team been told you should hit X, Y, and Z because this is the recipe. So it is really refreshing. And that was a feature of my entire Fright Fest. Like it's so great as a genre fan to see films that are doing something different, pushing the, the medium, doing what you can um with the resources you have available to us and i think it makes for more memorable more memorable film films yeah i couldn't agree more i mean um if, if i may I, i'm not going to mention specific but kieran i've been talking about this a lot actually is this idea of the horror aesthetic that's mm. being applied to some films now like they're coding things horror but they're not really like following through on that so it's like you'll have like well it's basically a comedy yeah um but they're like putting horror aesthetic onto it like no sh I've, I've enjoyed quite a bit of american horror story for instance but i feel like that kind of aesthetic has been taken and like eroded from film to film it's like a copy of a copy if, if you know what i mean it's, it's yeah. like what we, you know, we we call it we tend to refer to it as the kind of american horror story kind of uh vibe which is where something kind of just takes it 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 takes the notion or the aesthetic of a horror you know like recognizable horror stuff but doesn't actually really try to actually horrify or unsettle or create tension it's kind of there more as like a pastiche or almost camp you know and yeah. there's nothing wrong with that i mean we all love camp horror but it's like but i do think that there's a kind of element to which horror is somewhat getting lost sometimes is just purely kind of decorative well, or also, aesthetic. Th also i think you know there are certain studios that are trying to follow 
what A24 have been doing so well. Um, and like A24 are really uplifting a lot of really like interesting voices mm. and the studios just don't seem to be able to get their head around it. Yeah, it's that authorship as well. I think having, you can definitely tell, you know, you haven't got to be a film scientist. I'm not one. Um, to know when something has been decided by a creative team this was a decision that a writer made this was a decision a director made or a director of photography made versus this is a decision an executive made that wants to know about what their ROI is on this film like you can definitely see those directions and when they are and th when those choices are made because you're creating a product and not a piece of art and that's something that I've been a little fatigued by by some films recently but nothing that I saw at the festival, including Kill Your Lover. So good news, everybody. There's still great stuff on the way. Um, so, you know, we've talked about the past. We've talked about the present. Naturally, as Charles Dickens and A Christmas Carol would have us go, we need to talk about the future. What's next for, for all of you? Are you sticking with features? Are you dabbling back into shorts and anthologies? Where, where are your eyes next? I think it's very fair to say that features are the way. Um, yeah. We've got several scripts written, but one in particular um, is a werewolf movie called Alpha Freak that we're chomping at the bit at, um, yeah. which has been doing, yeah, is, is progressing very well, should yeah. we say. But to stay on Kill Your Lover for a second, um, we're very excited that the film's going to Overlook Film Festival in New Orleans next. Um, I'll be attending. So if anyone's there, come say hi. Um, and then we're also going to the amazing Hardline Film Festival, which is in Germany, um, which is just really, really fun. So that's the, the the near future for Kill Your Lover anyway. And then the good thing is that we've got distribution on it as well. Um, if you want to chat about that. Um, yeah, no, I mean, I think we're, we're going to we've uh, we we're going to be distributed in, in the UK. Sorry, not the UK. Sorry, we're going to be distributed in the US through Dark Sky. Um, so should be coming out sometime this year it's not been sort of like confirmed or anything yet um and then um we are still putting we're still looking for uk distribution at the moment so hopefully we'll come out uh at some point you know uh we will probably be hitting up some more uk festivals over the next year so there will be other opportunities for people in this country to check it out um uh, but yeah hopefully some halloween mm -hmm. shenanigans mm -hmm. that'd be fun wonderful um, yeah so obviously when all of these things happen, I do take a piece of homework away from every single uh, festival we attend. Ben will, um, bless him, put the show note in the show notes, the fe festivals he just mentioned. So if you are in New Orleans, if you are in Germany, you'll have those dates and the availability where you can perhaps catch the team live and see Kill, Kill Your Lover there. As we get other pieces of news on the distribution, the dates, be it cinema, streaming, wherever else in between, we will share those in our news sections of the show. I, we will share them. You know, the good thing is about social media is platforms may come and go, but those share buttons never wear out. So as the team share them, we will um, make sure we spread the word all we can. If people, you know, don't want to rely on my diligence as a third party, though, where can they follow you directly? So because our names are almost impossible to spell correctly, <laughs> especially yours here. Um, we basically operate under the the label, the production company Switchblade Cinema. So that seems to be something that people can spell quite easily. So um, that's uh, Instagram. You can find us there. Or our website is also switchblade-cinema.com where you can actually check out some of our shorts as well for free if you want um to get all that monster goodness uh yeah that's the easiest and then through that you can you know find us as well obviously um our individual mm -hmm. profiles um but yeah that's probably the best way uh mm -hmm. we also have a kill your lover instagram page if that's useful it's um kyl underscore movie because instagram does not like the word kill it's very sad yeah i'm i mean we've we've talked about things that are bumming us out recently that's that's similar as well you're not allowed to say any of the good words on there and they anymore otherwise they you get, get the algorithm never eradicate us <laughs> well i mean you know we, we make uh our, our our film is a is an 18 plus you know we we, we get all of the, the sort of the content warning so you know it makes sense that we would have an instagram page that we uh, have to censor ourselves mm. yeah 
Unalive Your Lover coming soon to all sanitized platforms. That would be the alternative title. <laughs> oh, yeah. Is love Unalive problematic? your intimate friend. Sorry, yeah. what was that? Uh, yeah, but Kira already nailed it. Unalive your intimate friend. Maybe lovers too edgy these days as well. Well, wonderful, wonderful stuff. I mean, I would not be able to let you go without a couple of generic horror fan, not generic, horror hangout specific horror hand questions for you here. So let's talk about some recommendations. I mean, your cinema goers, your festival goers, when you survive in a long session uh, at a, uh, a film festival, several films back to back, what is your what is your snack of choice, or do you just have to stack heavy on breakfast and then marathon it out? I mean, I really like uh, grenade protein bars. They're really sort of like they got like a, a really nice variety of different flavors. The Oreo one is particularly the one I like, um, and then just diet coke and a lot of coffee. Those are those are my pink glucoseid. Actually, yeah, I do really like I do really like pink glucoseid. Yeah, that, that, that's fun. <laughs> the, the zero sugar pink lemonade one i really oh, like okay. yeah that's what i mean um, and that's one of the that's one of the flavors that you're allowed right you're only allowed that orange that dark orange one when you sick in bed everything else then, <laughs> <that's fine. laughs> exactly exactly you know, i was always iron brew when i was sick in bed oh, oh. the dream how about you alex so uh, i would definitely have to say a flaming hot cheeto for me or um doritos heat wave because it's just got that like really nice tang it wakes you up as well i think you're just like okay i'm ready for the next movie need a bit of spice and also like you know smart choices sugar you're risking a sugar crash in that you know that midnight slot so yeah you got to get your savories in there too um True. okay oh, the sorry. the hardest heart you know most high pressure question of all now um obviously we do a show called horror hangout here the pressure's now going to be on the two of you. So you got people coming over. We're gonna have a we're gonna have a movie night. They say, you two make film films, you're 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 horror people. You're choosing what you're gonna put on for a hangout movie with a let's call it not a genre crowd, it's a mixed crowd. What are you gonna put on as a big crowd pleaser as you're getting a group of people over? Oh, he already knows what my answer is gonna be, so you better not steal it. No, you well, you go with your answer first, so then I don't steal it. Ready or not, hands down, boom. Because horror, but comedy, but mostly comedy, but dark and funny and relatable and just, well, Samara Weaving. Yeah. Need I say more? Say we, more. Actually, we, we do have a lot of movie nights. Have we done them? Uh, did we do Ready or Not? With, like, we, we showed my mom Ready or Not. Yes. Yeah. She had to see it. Yeah. I think, yeah, I think. Um, I've seen it so many times. I'm trying to remember all the times I've seen it. What's your movie? Josie and the Pussycats. <laughs> it's it's like it's it's a uh, it, it's it's horrifying in 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 many ways uh you know it's uh, about uh you know it, it's horrifying to look at and realize that um you know that uh, the that the the it's the 90s personified in every sort of like capacity and uh yeah i think i think that one's so entertaining and the music is oh everything's a bop um but it's um I think it's also like seeing different people's reactions. Oh, yeah. Josie and the Pussycats is hilarious. So I've, I, we had like, you know, she wouldn't mind me saying this. She's one of my best friends, but we had her over for a movie night and we were like, we're going to put this on. And she is effectively the oldest 25 year old you've ever met in your life. So she had a great time watching the movie, but she was also incredibly bad. It's wonderful. Like I love, I love the experience of confusing people with a yeah. movie night. <laughs> um, I will say, so if I'm if I'm gonna be serious for a second and do an actual like horror movie, I think one of the ones that's really funny to like show people and just get like a reaction is Life Force because wow, that movie is just <laughs> so baffling. But it's also great because so much of it is meetings. Everyone can kind of talk while that's going on. Like there's so much room to actually have conversation while the movie is happening. And then suddenly you'll have like crazy person's soul being sucked out of them by a topless vampire lady from space. Um, and then by the end of it, you just look at it and you go, God bless the mountains of cocaine that allowed this movie to happen. Um, you know, so yeah, I mean, I'll go with, I'll, I'll go, Josie and Pussycats was my was my fun answer, but Life Force would be my serious answer. Well, why not a double bill? Double bill, Josie what and Pussycats. A, what a double bill. So this is what our listeners can expect. Should you find yourself invited to a movie marathon around at this couple's house, then this is what you can look forward to. Um, Alex Gear, thank you so much for spending a little time with us. I know that we were 
sort of ships in the night at the event. So yeah. um, really nice to catch up properly. Um, Thank you very much for making the time. I know I'm so glad we managed to get around to it and I'm you know hopefully this will be an opportunity for other people to hear about where they can see Kill Your Liver look out for it in the future as well I'd certainly recommend you watch it everybody so um yeah watch out for more news and we'll get on to it very soon um for everyone else for right now thank you for listening if you enjoyed the show you can become a patron over at patreon.com forward slash our hangout thanks to our old mate Taj Easton for our theme music thanks to ACAS for hosting the show all the other stuff. If you listen to us anywhere, whatever platform it's on, if it supports ratings, chuck one on there. It helps with algorithms and the like. Also, you can join us all over the socials. You can find us at the Facebook group, the Horror Hangout Board of Advisors, Suggest Films. We have a Discord. We have a TikTok. We have an Instagram. Type in Horror Hangout Podcast. You'll find it. In the meantime, though, thank you, Alex. Thank you, Keir. Goodbye for now, everybody. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye.